All right, good morning, everybody. I think we're going to get started. It looks like I think everybody's trickled in. So thanks for coming out. Our presentation is on total precast systems, but really we're going to tell you why it should be your next system. Um, so myself and Jason are from Stubby's Precast. Uh, we've been in the precast industry for about 35 years, uh, but really been heavily active in the total precast market for about nine years. So we got our start in the agricultural market and then over time progressed into uh, the commercial industry doing the hollow core floors and then progressed further to structural components uh, leading up to our total precast systems. So, uh, like I said, I'm Sean Bickle. Um, I come from a program at Mohawk College, Civil Engineering and Technology. Uh, joined Stubby's Precast right out of school, been with them ever since, started as an estimator, and now have progressed to total precast sales rep, really kind of the initial consult early on. Once it becomes a project, it gets handed off. Uh, Jason Stubby here has been with the company since he could pretty much walk. Uh, he's done every job you could imagine, so he's a good guy to have around. He kind of just knows a little bit about everything. Um, so to date, we've done about 35 of these buildings. Uh, it's constantly growing. We've got a few on the go right now. Uh, we've priced over 100 proposals. Um, the technology's been around for a long time, uh, but recently it's really started to take, take grasp in North America. So it's very popular in Europe, uh, and, and we've really tried to lead the pack in, in setting the trend to show people why they should be using this system. So we're going to start with the advantages first, and then we're going to tell you how to maximize those advantages with some design tips. So if anybody has any questions throughout the process, just interrupt, let us know. We'd like it to be very open. Um, that way you don't forget your questions at the end of the uh, presentation. So what is Total Precast? If you don't know what it is, uh, really it's just a, a combination of architectural and structural components that are manufactured off-site, shipped to site, and erected. Um, typical reinforcement is either your conventional rebar or pre-stressing. Um, some of the higher buildings may be post-tensioned as well, but we haven't got into that yet. Advantages of total precast. One of the biggest advantages, as you can see here, is speed of erection. Uh, so really, this is our number one marketing tool. Many people will see it happening around them. They'll be in the neighborhood. They'll say, this building went up so quick. Who did it? How did they do it? A couple different examples here. So we've got a 13-story building on the left-hand side. It went up in nine weeks. We've got a 12-story building on the right-hand side. It went up in 13 weeks. You're approximately 45,000 square foot of deck on the left one and about 130 on the right. Um, this is just a sample of a couple of projects we've done. Some of these actually had some tricky components as well. So if you really simplified your system and had your, your maximum optimization of your components, your floors and your, and your walls are optimized, you could meet that target below at the bottom saying you could do approximately 8,000 square feet in five working days. So this is our number one advantage. Hands down, this is what everybody sees. This is what everybody wants to know how it's done. Um, but there's many other advantages too that we're going to touch on as well. Manufactured in a controlled environment. So we are a CPCI certified plant. Uh, we do pre-pour, post-pour inspections, lots of geometry checks. Uh, there's a lot of eyes on these panels before they're poured and then even after poured there's a lot of eyes on them before they're shipped. What this does, this is allows us to have really tight tolerances on site. Um, it also allows us to get fine details because the guys are warm. So you can imagine if you're in the middle of the winter and you're trying to set up forms and it's blowing, it's snowing, you're trying to use your fingers. I'm not going to lie, you're probably going to cheat a little bit just to get the job done just to get it poured. Whereas we're in a warm environment here, you've got your boss, you've got the QC manager checking what you're doing, you can't cheat. So we can really push the capacity of the precast knowing that we could get the tolerances tight with the rebar and you know inserts, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is another big advantage of total precast. You're going to get good quality. All weather installation. So this doesn't look fun. I wouldn't want to do it myself, but uh, this again is another advantage we have. The only thing that's going to slow us down is wind. Um, we also need to grout our components as well. So there's temperatures that you allow to grout, so we add admixtures. We're good to about minus five. Um, but other than that, there's nothing that really slows us down. We've got big bolted connections, big welted connections, so it's real easy for us to do, manufacture our panels, ship them to site, do big connections, keep moving. Like I said, as long as the wind's not real heavy, we're okay, we can swing. Multiple finishes. So. A lot of people picture precast concrete and they don't realize all the architect architectural things you could do with it. So I'm going to start with our most economical panel to probably our most premium panel. And you'll see as we go through that some of these buildings combine both. But I'll start with this is your most economical panel. It's a smooth panel. It's either painted or stained, uh, typically two coats. You could pick any color you want. So you go with Benjamin Moore paint wheel, say I like that blue, I like that green. We'll make you a couple samples, you approve it. That's how your buildings gets painted. Um, this is really common with your hotels, your student residences, something where the budget is really precedent. You, you don't necessarily care about the wow factor in like a condo where you're going to charge more so they're going to expect more. This is really, I just need a durable product that looks clean, looks good, 
and it's as cheap as you can possibly get it for me because I want to get as much profit as I can. So again, that's your smooth, stained, or painted panels. What we have here is a form liner panel. So really what that is, it's a plastic mold that we lay down on the bed before we put in our reinforcement. And when we pour the concrete and peel it back up, it's going to create this pattern. You can mimic brick, you can mimic stone, you can mimic many, many things. Uh, this is very advantageous in keeping a wall section thin. So typically if you had a poured structural wall and then you had to skin it with veneer, your section gets bigger and you're paying for two systems there. Our advantage is, is we're trying to mimic the veneer but have it in the structural section. So this allows us to have a nice finished building as it's going up. A lot of people say this looks great instead of a big gray building that doesn't have any pattern or any detail. Um, real advantageous on the condo side for sure with you know some, some selling during construction. Uh, a lot of guys too will they'll mix so they'll do a couple of these form liner panels at your first two levels like you see here. Uh, this guy actually used form liner all the way up but other guys will switch at about the third level to that more economical panel you saw before. Uh, that allows when people walking by on the street, they see it, it looks nice, what they can touch and feel looks really good. But when you're looking three, four stories up, it still looks good and you're saving money. So that's really a good, a good way to look at these buildings if you, uh, you want a wow factor, but you don't want to go premium all the way up. It's a, good, it's a good way to look at it for sure. And then lastly, we've got a multi-tonal stain, which we just started getting into. And this is still using that form liner pattern. But what they're doing is they're coming and they're, they're hitting the building with one base coat and then they're spot hitting bricks. And what this does is it really mimics a brick look. Uh, I think it looks incredible. We've got a lot of positive feedback. And it's a reasonable price. It's actually not a huge premium to do this. Far cheaper than trying to skin your building with a brick veneer. Uh, so these are some ideas of what you can do. There's many other things we can do as well. Um, so we have a booth at the con Concrete Pavilion. Come see us if you're curious about finishes. We'll tell you a lot more. I just kind of wanted to touch on it real quick for everybody. Another advantage we have is we're the one main structural trade on site. Anybody that's done any type of major project knows coordination can be a killer, budget, time, stress, headaches. So what we try to do is we try to keep as many other trades out as possible to keep us moving forward so that the GC, the owner, the consultant can focus on the other things like finishing, mechanical, electrical, et cetera, et cetera. So by the one main structural trade in site, really what we'll do is we provide all the structural components. And then you can see in the top left picture there, there's a steel lintel going across the corridor. We're going to include for those as well. So that as we're going up the building, you don't need to bring in a steel trade for you know, 10 or 12 lintels and then they go away for a week and come back and do it again. We'll put that in our scope. What we'll also do is we'll take care of all your core drilling. So really what that is, is that's your plumbing, your mechanical, your electrical penetrations. Anywhere from two to six inches we can drill on site. Uh, the key thing is we need to know where they are early on. So one thing with total precast, you gotta do a bit of a mind shift. You need to get your mechanical and your electrical in earlier. And what that does, it allows us to locate it on our drawings designed for their penetrations and openings so that when it's on site, it moves smooth, and then when they ask for a hole here, we were already prepared for it. If we aren't prepared for it, we may not have designed for it, and that can get tricky sometimes. So we'll always work with you to try to, like anything, things change as you build, and we understand that, so we have some conservative factors built in when we design, but you really need to let us know where this stuff is because Precast has a strand pattern that runs the length of it, and if you start compromising the strand, your slab will fail. So these locations, these openings, is crucial during the design phase. Any opening bigger than six inches, we can still manufacture during the production process. And what we're going to do is we're going to box out an opening, put in a foam insert. So things like your mechanical vents, maybe bigger openings, chases, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can roll that into our initial design early on and give you those openings. So when you get to site, everything's ready to go. Just plug and play with your ducks and your grills. Lastly, we give the option to include for exterior caulking. Um, this is crucial. The biggest point of failure on a precast building will be the joints. So we've done our due diligence, we've brought in experts, third-party testing to make sure that our joints are tight, they're sealed, uh, we meet OAA requirements for a caulking spec, um, but we've also increased uh, a spec for the horizontal as well, but Jason's going to touch on that a little later, so I don't want to get too much into it. Um, but these are things that we'll include for. But really all you need to provide us in most cases is a foundation like you see in the bottom left-hand corner. Once the foundations are poured, we take up from there and we'll take the main structure from there. We do offer foundation walls as well, but they don't always work with your site constraints. So Jason will touch on that later as well. Another advantage we have is we're in-house service start to finish. So what that means is we're going to join you early on in the construction design phase, ideally. So maybe not when you're sketching on a napkin, but before you went to that site permit, that pre-sale, any of that components, bring us in. Because what we're going to do is we're going to try to shift and do some tweaks to your layout to save you money. Ultimately, profit drives anything. So we want to make sure you're making as much money as you can and not paying for something later when we said we could have helped you if you got us in earlier. So the number one thing you need to do is get us in early. 
Myself is going to be someone that's going to come join you. We're going to work together. I'm going to see what kind of flexibility you have with your layout. And we're going to do our best to, to be the most optimal economical system. From there, we're going to get into a pricing stage. So if you're happy with the tweaks to the layout, everything's OK, all parties are on board, we're going to put a budget number to it. From there, you're going to say, yes, this works for me. No, it's too high, too low. Can we tweak it? We finally come to an agreement, and then it moves to the next stage. What happens then is a project manager is going to join your team. They're going to come to all your meetings with your engineers, your architects, your owners, your main trades. You're going to have all your meetings where you're going through the nuts and bolts of the project. And they're going to give you efficiencies all along the way. They're going to tell you how big openings have to be. You know, I need this here. I need this much precast here above the window. Certain things that Jason will touch on later as well. Um, but it's crucial to have those guys in early before you start setting all your other things in place and you can't move them later. From that stage, it comes to a 3D modeling stage. So you can see here in the middle is a 3D model. We use techless structures. And what that does is it basically builds the whole building and then breaks them into individual pieces. So if you can see, it's kind of hard to see in that picture there. But Every panel will get its own shop drawing, so when it goes to the plant, the guys understand the ge geometry, what's getting cast in. But that needs to be all put together to make sure every, all the interference is taken care of, we have nothing overlapping, there's no you know, steel in the way of this, or this panel doesn't fit right, it's off, it's on. So things like that, it's nice to catch in a model. We really have minimized the amount of errors on site by having these models, because you can really cut a section anywhere you want and see how everything's interacting. From that model, it gets sent to the production plant and they start producing the individual components. What we're going to do is we're going to try to get about two or three levels ahead of you, store those in our yard so that at any given time if we get a good pace going and we get ahead of our proposed schedule, we always have product ready to go to be installed so there's never delays on site. Like I said before, our biggest advantage is speed, so we want to be prepared to make sure that if opportunities arise, we're ready to be there and keep moving that schedule forward. After installation, we'll do a final sign-off with our engineer and the building's yours to finish. So these are a couple more reasons why total precast is economical. Really, it's, it's a durable system. Concrete, everybody knows concrete's strong, it's tough. Um, so you can leave it exposed as well. So we've done a few buildings, where, like a student residence, where they wanted exposed corridors, concrete. They just know over time students are going to mark up drywall, get it all dirty and messy. So they'd rather just leave the concrete exposed. It's a clean look, they're happy with it. Um, substantial completion and less working days. So we touched on that as speed. Uh, but the big thing is, is loans. A lot of these guys are taking out pretty big loans to build these buildings. So if I can get people in your building sooner, you can start generating money, which means you're paying less interest on your loans. So ideally, the sooner you can get people in your building, the happier most owners are. It can be enclosed quicker as well to save on heating costs. Heating is a pure loss of money during construction. A lot of guys will try to stagger their builds so they're not constructing through the winter, so they're not blowing their budget on heating. Our advantage is, since we can work through the winter, you can minimize the amount of heating you need. The only time we would really need heating is when it gets real cold in temperature and we need it for grouting. But even then, it's a, it's a quick heat me up the day before we're grouting, get me up to temp. When you're done, take it away. We're okay. So that's a huge advantage too that sometimes isn't measured in your initial analysis of the building, but it's something to consider when you're looking at the whole package. What will this cost me? Does this make sense? Uh, everybody knows concrete has superior fire resistance and acoustical control. So we get a lot of positive feedback from repeat owners saying, you know, our, our building's great. Um, we would almost wish we had more precast walls, which sounds kind of crazy because what we'll do is we'll try to optimize our spans to minimize the amount of vertical load-bearing walls. So sometimes we'll skip every other suite and we'll get guys coming back in the next building saying, can we tweak the building so every suite has a concrete wall? Every other one's complaining about noise except for yours. So it's the little things like that may not matter as much in an apartment, but if you get a, a high-end condo where people spend a lot of money, they're going to be pretty demanding and they, they don't want to hear their neighbors. So something to consider that sound control is a huge advantage. Uh, cheaper insurance as well. So uh, life cycle building, if you're a REIT, you're going to hold this building for 25 years or so. We've had a lot of guys say over time this, this pays off. There's a lot cheaper insurance compared to, to wood. I don't want to knock other systems, but that's one of our competitors and uh, we definitely have the advantage over them in that scenario. And lastly, less maintenance. Concrete's pretty durable. You can spray it, you can clean it. Some of our painted buildings over time, you might, you might be able to just do a recoat on it to make it look brand new and flashy. But there's not a ton of maintenance involved with these buildings compared to some of the other systems where we have a lot of overlapping materials. So really that's, that's a quick nutshell on all the advantages. We have many more, but this is a, a quick, quick, simple way to kind of explain why, why people are looking at this system and, and understanding that it's a good way to go forward if you're you know, trying to do a different system or you're looking for advantages through, through tough conditions like our Ontario winners. So now we're going to get into some design tips and challenges. So in order to take all the advantages of total precast, you really got to look at the nuts and bolts of during the design phase. So 
The big thing that a lot of people ask us is, what's the engineering scope? Who's involved? Do I need an engineer? When do they come in? What do they need to do? Engineers included are always asking us this as well. So you still will need an engineer of record on your project. Their responsibility is to give us the design loads so that we can engineer our building. So we're going to have a precast engineer for the precast structure, but you're still going to have an engineer of record for the project. And what that engineer record is going to do is they're going to give us the design loads, then we're going to design our building, and then we're going to give him, back the him or her back the reactions so that they can design the foundation. So together we're going to work to create this building, but they also need to take care of any other systems that are involved. So if you have steel components or another system involved, how it marries to our precast, there's going to, they're going to be involved in that design as well. But what we're really trying to do is to reduce their scope so that they can concentrate on the other systems as well, and we take on the engineering scope. We are specialists, we know what we do, uh, we know all the advantages we have, um, but we do lean on engineers that have precast experience as well, because you speak the same language. So it is, it's a bit of a learning curve, um, but once the engineers understand how it works, uh, they're typically quite, um, quite cooperative and understand that you need to give and take, um, but we need them to. We need their, their oversight to understand how the other things are working. Uh, we've looked at potentially bringing on the engineer of record scope on our own, uh, but to date, we've kind of kept it separate, and that has its advantages and disadvantages as well. But if you're curious more about that, let me know when we can talk about it another day. The big thing, really, that's going to drive your cost is your layout. I can save you money in little pieces here and there, but your layout's really going to dictate that overall cost. So we've got a couple different types of layouts that are most common. So I'm going to go through about three that you're going to see. Uh, this is your most economical layout. So this is your sweet wall to sweet wall layout. And what that means is you can see these walls in the far left corner are going across. It's really dividing the individual suites. We're using those as our load-bearing walls. We're going to land our hollow core across the load-bearing walls. It's going to bear on each wall, on each suite wall. And that's going to carry up the entire building. What you really want to concentrate on is making sure these stack. When you start staggering those walls going down, I can cater to that design, but it's going to cost you a lot more money. I need to start adding beams, columns, maybe solid precast planks. That's really going to drive your budget. So something as simple as just aligning your load-bearing walls can save you a ton of money. I do understand when you get to a lobby, the ground floor, you need big open area. That's okay. We'll cater to beams and columns in those scenarios. But really, I'd ideally, try to keep that line all the way up to the top. Everybody likes a big penthouse. I understand that. So we try to work in those scenarios too. Um, that's crucial. This is crucial to saving money. This is also great for thermal. We're going to touch on that a little bit later too. But what this allows us to do is when we span this hollow core across right here, you can see we can leave a gap at the exterior wall to allow us to run continuous insulation all the way up. That's going to give you a great barrier. So those are two great reasons why you should look at sweet wall to sweet wall layouts, but I understand it doesn't work for every building application. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the other one as well that's quite common. is your corridor to exterior layout. So what you'll see here is you've got a low bearing wall down the center, and then your exterior wall is acting as a low bearing wall as well. So this is also quite common, um, but it is slightly less economical. And the reason it's slightly less economical is you can see over here we have all these window openings. So I need to get a lot of steel around these openings since they're my load bearing wall. So really it's acting as a big column and beam scenario over each window. There's a lot of steel in those panels. Therefore it's going to drive up my cost per square foot. But this layout does have advantages as well. So it's going to be slightly more money but it gives you flexibility down the road. So say today you're building an apartment but maybe in 10 years you want to convert it to a condo. What this allows you to do is put any non-low-bearing stud wall along this scenario. So you could do small suites, but maybe in five years you could blow up that stud wall and make really big condo suites. So this layout is good for flexibility in that sense, um, but there's a lot more steel in our exterior panels. So it's something to consider. You know, look at your site conditions. If, if this is the, the route you want to go, if it's a long-term hold, consider this. But if you're looking for economical performance, suite to suite layout is probably your better bet. Lastly, you'll get a hybrid layout. So it's really a combination of both, or they'll switch span directions throughout the building. Uh, this is usually a function of some type of design or constraint to the site. Sometimes they want the end units to overlook a lake, so they may have the sweet wall, sweet wall layout, but we want to open up the end one for this beautiful view. So sometimes we're combining the two. Uh, this is okay, just the big thing you want to consider still is can I bring that, that low bearing wall all the way down? That is one thing with precast you need to really concentrate on. Staggering the walls is, is a little trickier. Uh, so look at that every time you're in the initial stage of your design. How am I getting these walls to the foundation? That's the biggest thing to consider. And lastly, it's just a clean shot showing how our, our low bearing walls are stacked all the way down. Uh, this allows you to, to, we specialize in providing the whole exterior finish, so we're going to come and we're going to clad across here. But you could also put glazing here. You could do whatever wall system you want there. So this does give you flexibility with the exterior look of your building as well. 
Span optimization. So this is a big one. Uh, a lot of times we'll get a building that was designed cast in place, your typical 20-foot base spans. Uh, we want to maximize our spans as much as we can because your load-bearing verticals are a lot more expensive than your horizontal elements. So if we can get as many of those load-bearing walls out that we don't need by optimizing the span, uh, you're going to save money overall, really. That's what that means. So you can see my, my comment before about a rough bay of about 20 feet. Ideally, we would like to knock that wall out and skip to the next, but that puts me at 40 feet. So it forces me to go to 12-inch holocore. If you can keep that to 38 feet, 10-inch holocore, that will be your best span all day long. Majority of our buildings, as they're looking for efficiencies, they're constantly pushing and pushing, and that's the sweet spot that we've found. So your most ideal economical building would be about a 20,000 square foot deck with a 38 foot span. That is as cheap as it's going to get for precast, what we found. So your jump from 8 inch holocore to 10 inch holocore isn't a huge price difference. So if you can get that much more open space with a slight increase in cost, it's something to consider. Uh, 12 inch and 14 inch holocore isn't quite as common. Typically in like a garage roof loading condition or maybe a terrace on the roof that has snow drift plus pavers, et cetera, et cetera, has a bit higher loading condition. So therefore we need a thicker section. But these are the four uh, thicknesses that we offer, but there's times where we need to introduce solid precast planks as well, which we'll touch on a little later. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the defense, um, cost-wise, what's the difference there? You'd be, I couldn't tell you percentage-wise, but you'd be roughly about 50 cents from the eight to 10, and then you're gonna go about a buck, and about a buck 50 for each spread. So you can see that 50 cents isn't too bad, but you're really stretching it when you go to the next. So that's dependent, there's a couple things that that's dependent upon, but that's a good rule of thumb. So I'm the uneducated second class speaker, so. <laughs> um, yeah, that's so, how it works. <laughs> so just a reminder, if you've got questions, throw up your hand, blurt it out, um, try to make this interactive as possible. Um, so wall panel optimization. So basically when we're doing the building, we try to make the panels as big as possible to start with. The bigger the panel, the faster the building's going up and it's also cheaper. So if we're building a panel that's 50 square feet versus a panel that's 100 square feet versus a panel that's 150 square feet big, we still have to put four sides on that panel. So if we can spread that over 150 square feet versus 50 square feet, it brings our cost per panel down. So really what governs that is the crane. Um, most jobs we use a tower crane. We need about 22,000 pounds per panel is usually what we try to get. And then your walls will be 20 to 30 feet long. Um, this is a, a load bearing wall. So you'll notice there's kind of a ledge at the top, so that's, we've left it as a 10 inch ledge where the holocore is going to sit on. And then below that you'll have about 300. So we need about a foot over top of any openings so to create basically a beam cage inside the panel. And then we'll have like almost like column cages down beside that. Um, at the bottom, you'll notice that we've left meat at the bottom too. That in a low bearing wall that is not necessarily required. So if we don't, let's say you have a patio door that goes out onto a balcony. We don't necessarily need that to go down. What we'll do is we'll cast in some tempor temporary bars. So we'll have the full doorway. We'll just cast in some 25 mil bars just to, for stripping, handling, and loading it on site. Once it's in place, we cut out the bars and you have your full opening. Um, this is a non-load bearing wall. So inside the buildings, your sweet to sweet walls, if we're going with that layout, will they'll be eight inches thick uh, normally on a zero to six story. On a building that's 10 stories, your bottom levels might be 10 inches thick, and then we'll switch to eight inches thick as we kind of move up. On a high rise, so a 28, 30 story building, we'll be 12 inches probably down at the bottom, go to 10 inches and eight inches as we progress up the building as the loads get less. And then on the exterior, so we basically have the sweet walls laying like this. The exterior non-loading bearing walls actually hang off of the load bearing walls. So they don't need a foundation below, they're actually supported like a beam back onto each floor. So there's a knife that sticks out of each side of the panel, sits on a weld plate on the load bearing walls. So this wall essentially acts like a truss or a beam. So you'll notice we need about 200, so you can have mechanical openings, that's why we left those little boxes out there to show you. But below the mechanical openings or above the mechanical openings, we're gonna need a minimum of 275 mil. This is to allow pre-stressing strand to run through the panel so that we can carry the force back out to those load bearing walls. And then on the bottom, we need that same distance. We need about 10 inches on the bottom. So we'll run pre-stressing strand down the bottom, down the top, and then just some rebar in between. And then to get that truss-like factor, we like to throw in some verticals in between your openings as well. That's not necessarily required, but it increases the rebar and the cost if we don't have some of that.
Um, so glazing sections. So normally, punch windows is usually your most economical option, um, and especially if you're doing the six inch cladding walls on the exterior. But obviously, just because it's economical, it still needs to look good as well. So we'll use two story or four story glazing, but we still need structure in behind that glazing to support the precast. So what we'll do is we'll leave a three inch recess in the wall panel. You can kind of see the recesses going up there, the window's installed. So the window will run up past the concrete load bearing section so that it looks like it's multi-story glass. But in behind that, we'll still have a three to five inch ledge to bear the precast on. Um, we'll probably need five, three to five, it'd be a five inch ledge. Um, so it might make your wall a little thicker. So if you could, if it was a zero to six door and you can get away with an eight inch wall, depending on the size of your recess, we might have to go to a 10 inch wall. Um, but it allows you to get that nice strip of glass up the building. Uh, the other way we can do that is we can actually just make this two separate panels and then just put a steel lintel across as well. On the non-load bearing walls though, we definitely need concrete meat in behind to run the pre-stressing strand. So then you'd have to leave the recess and make your wall just a little bit thicker. Just some more examples of the glazing. You can kind of see here the concrete panel left in behind. Uh, what some guys are doing too is they're just using punch windows and then painting the piece below the two below the windows black. So if this is all dark gray or whatever, they'll paint that black so you get the tint of the window plus the black makes it look like it's multi-story glass, but really it's just concrete sections in between versus spandrel. Um, just some details on how the wall panels go together. Uh, so this is the load bearing condition. We'll always bring our our joint between floors to the top of floor. So we basically will leave a ledge in the wall where the holocore sits on, and then the next wall will sit on top of that. That allows us to grout that joint solid, leave a nice grout bed for the next wall above to set on top of. Um, you'll see here, this is our main structural connection. We don't really see it on that one. But basically it's a female cast in splicer bar into the top of the wall panel. So it's basically like a big nut welded to a piece of rebar. We'll erect the panel on site, brace it, spin in a male splicer bar, put the holocore in. Once the next panel comes, we'll drop the panel over top. It'll have a grout sleeve in the panel. It'll stick up about four feet and then 90 out the side of the wall. So they're all located most of the time perfectly uh, to slide over top. Once we got it slid over top, we brace it. Once all the panels are installed, we'll go back and we'll pump all those grout sleeves, basically like three inch conduits full of grout, giving your cast in place connection from floor to floor. So that's our main structural connection. Um, joint ceiling details. So you'll notice here you have the two stage joint. So we'll, we'll put a face bead in the face and then behind that we'll do a second stage joint that weeps out at every floor, just below the floor. Um, that's a typical OAA detail right out of their book. But then the horizontal, uh, because total structural precast wasn't really a common detail at the time, uh, we hired EXP and James Lishkoff to do a bunch of testing with us and we came up with a two stage joint on the horizontal as well. So we have a face bead, some thin packer rope, and then a second bead in behind, and then that all weeps out at the verticals as well. What about your thermal bridging there? Yeah, so with thermal bridging, um, with your suite to suite layout, the only time you really get that is on your two exterior walls. Um, now that's some of the reason the guys will rotate the exterior as well, so now you still get it somewhere. Um, so we'll, they'll either use the 2% rule because now they only have those two exterior wall lines that have that, or they'll do energy modeling to get past that. Um, one other option, um, it's not probably the most economical, but to go with an insulated wall panel. So normally we only insulate exterior stairwells or exterior elevators because you want a nice durable wall on the inside. You don't want to be strapping and drywalling an elevator or a stairwell. So we'll do an insulated wall automatically there. But if it's in, right now it's not cost effective to do an insulated wall panel. An insulated wall panel will do is we'll give you a three inch face mix with whatever finish you want on the wall four inches of foam, and then your structural wall in behind. So you end up with a wall that's 15 to 20 inches thick, depending on your loads. Yep. What's the benefit of uh, the spring insulation, if you consider it that you put it as others and not being part of your scope of work? Would that be beneficial for a owner or a developer or a general contractor to put that underneath your scope of work? Because I'm looking at it, there's like, it's concrete panels, concrete panels, and concrete panels. Yep. Not normally. So the process that we go through is basically once a wall is put in, 
um, we'll, the stud guy will come in, he'll leave a one inch gap. Okay. They'll put a two and a half inch stud or a three and a half inch stud, depending on the owner. Then they'll run all their electrical, their mechanical, their plumbing, and then they'll spray foam over top of that just before drywall. At that point, a lot of times we're long gone already. Um, it's just your typical, there's no real headaches with that trade. So. You say you paint your panels? Uh, so we put a BASF coating on. Um, so that goes on the exterior of the panel, mm -hmm. and that's done at the same time as the caulking. What does that cost, that coating? That coating runs you probably two to 250 a square foot installed. It's a two coat process. Uh, you can get it either in a smooth or in a sand. So the sand looks like a stucco finish, or the smooth, just a smooth finish. Um, and then you have the staining option as well. Any other questions on this particular? Yep. When you're saying two parts, so like an epoxy or? The two stage? The two stage. No, so it's a, we use a Dimonic, I'm gonna get this name right, Dimonic 100. Um, so basically it's your face bead, which is getting all your UV, all your, your wind, your rain. So eventually that's gonna break down and wear out. But then you have a second bead of caulking that's spaced, let's say two or three inches behind it. That's not getting any sun, it's not getting any rain, it's not exposed to the weather. So it's not being wore down. So if it ever does leak past the first stage of caulking, it's got the second stage of caulking to stop it. And then it weeps the water out at the floor joints so that it's outside the building again versus going in the building. Did that answer that? Yep. Um, this is the non-load bearing wall scenario. So we were talking about thermal bridging on the load bearing. With the non-load bearing, because we don't actually set the panels on top, there's no reason to, we can actually leave a two to three inch gap in between the wall and the floor. We'll put in a smoke seal bead on the underside, and then you can spray foam that joint as well, so you get continuous insulation up the face of that panel. So the only thermal bridging you get is on the load bearing walls, not on these walls. The same caulking detail up, uh, applies. Um, two stage verticals, two stage horizontals. Um, other net. We'll have some structural connections that come out at the bottom of the six inch panel and get welded to the top of the holocore. We'll have cast in plates in the holocore. They get welded to that just to keep that panel from bowing during thermal. That, that doesn't show uh, a topping slab or you're not using a topping slab? So all, with all the total precast buildings, so if just a regular holocore floor in a school, or not a school, but like a, an old age home, a mezzanine, whatever, they'll use three eighths average skim coat. It's a typically spec product in Ontario at least. Um, with the total precast, we actually go with a 5 8 average skim coat. Uh, we'd recommend something like a Level Rock 3500. Um, it's not a pure gypsum, it's got some cementitious value. It's getting you a 3500 PSI. Um, it's a good product. What that does, it doesn't not level your floor, it makes your floor flat. So bring your floor back to, because Holocore's cambered. Holocore's a pre-stressed product. With a strand, basically as it's cut, it'll camber up. Could be anywhere from an inch to inch and a half. Um, with the skim coat, it'll level it back out and get it within the, skim, the flooring tolerance of quarter inch and 10 feet. You don't need that to keep the, the planks together? Oh, in between the planks, there'll be grout. So in between the planks, we'll grout the planks as we're installing them. So the sides of the planks actually have like a V joint with a key, and then we'll fill those with grout to lock the floors together. If you're doing that full skim coat before you leave it, it's not. Yeah, so it actually happens after all the interior walls are built. Yeah, because, because you're only working with the 5 eighths of material, the smaller the areas they have to level, the easier it is to get those rooms nice and level. So normally the studs up, you can either go with just a deep track on your stud, so that you have a little bit of room for the concrete to come up, or the guys will hang their drywall, prime their drywall, and just before finished painting, they'll come in and skim everything, and then finish painting and start your carpentry work. Does that mean you need a moving uh, slot of track in the top of all your walls? Mm, I think they just go with a bit of a deeper track. Not exactly sure, to be honest, but. On the uh, uh, repairing walls in this case, are the, uh, they go across the building, right? They're not on the face. So they're yeah, yeah, they're like a sweet wall layout, yep. So, and the exterior panel hangs on that, they would like, is it like a, a steel plate? Yeah, so it's like a steel plate, so there'll be like a plate cast into, I'll actually have a picture of the detail coming up. It's like a steel plate cast into the load bearing wall, and then there's like a, a knife, big metal plate that hangs out the back side of the six inch wall and they sit on there, they get bolted back with connections to the load bearing walls as well as to the floor. So your insulation can go through that as well? Yeah, on the six inch wall, we can leave a two to three inch gap and the insulation runs up past. So in that case, the panels are standing on top of each other, are they? Yeah, and yeah, so there's actually a one inch gap in between everything. Um, so all the horizontal joints will leave a 25 mil gap. That's just for tolerance for erection. 
Um, but that's just an empty joint in this case because it's a six inch wall. So that'll just get, you could spray foam it, but it gets a two stage caulking detail. But if they're standing on top of each other or they're acting as horizontal beams? This, this, in this case here, this is a non load bearing wall, so it's acting as a horizontal beam. Um, good question. There isn't, a, with residential loading, we don't see a lot of long-term deflection. Um, haven't really run into that, to be honest with you. Yeah, but in yeah. a commercial building? Oh, in a commercial building with higher loads? Yeah, yeah they'll leave some play in their tolerances uh, with, for window systems, et cetera. They'll have some sliding joints, right? If you have a window glazing on the exterior. always from the exterior. So if it's a six story, we'll use uh, just man baskets to get up there and do the caulking work. If it's a high rise, we'll drop swing stage over the side once the building's built, do all the two stage joints on the exterior, and then do whatever staining or painting needs to be done to the panel at that time. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so it'll be two layers of back rod, one behind the inner bead and one behind the exterior bead as well. Uh, on the exterior building, we put that into our price, so that's part of our overall price. Um, on a face of the building, you're probably a buck a square foot. On the face of the building, roughly. Um, so here's some of those insulated walls. Um, so like I explained before, we'll use these in the stairwells because you want that nice durable concrete surface. Paint your stairwell, you're done. Um, so we'll use that on the exterior stairwells, elevators, and as well as the mechanical penthouses. Just, you, you don't want to be finishing up there. It's a nice, durable product. Keep in mind that wall does get fairly thick. So here's some of the, that main structural connection. Looks like I got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, so that's that grout tube. You can see the rebar sticking up in the grout tube. So we'll, the engineers will say, okay, normally you'll see them every three to six feet down the length of the panel or if it's a panel with a lot of openings, you'll see them focused on the ends of the panels. And then we'll have our 10 mil bars that get drilled in and epoxied in between all our hollow core joints to connect the floors to the walls. You can kind of see this L bar here. There. Now there is no time. So basically the, the process on site is we'll install the floors, grout them, stand the next level of walls, brace them, go around with a grout pump, pump all the grout tubes full of grout. Once that's done, we'll start setting floors right away. As the floors are being set and if the grout started, is hardening, then we'll start to take the braces off the panels and move up to the next level. What's the grout strength that you want to have when you install these? Uh, so the grout in the holocore will be a 25 MPA that holds the floors together. The grout in the grout sleeves and under the walls would be a 40 to 45 MPA. So. That's not affected by weather? Uh, so the grout in the walls, we can get up to minus 20. The grout in the floors, that's what Sean was saying, where you'd actually have to, if you get into below, minus, below zero, you need to just tarp your windows in. We recommend that anyways. It stops the snow from getting in. It allows the trays to, trades to work in that floor. You turn the heat on the night before. We grout the next day. Once the grout's dry, you turn the heat off. Um, but for the wall grout, we've got grout that'll go up to minus 20, so you don't need to heat for that. Yep. For the insulated walls that you showed me, two slides back, what do you use as the uh, bridging uh, shear connector or wind connector? So if it's a composite panel, we usually work with like a Dayton product to make the two sides composite. Normally we're not designing as composite, so then there's just a pins to keep it from falling off the face of the building, plastic pins that go in. Um, this is the wall panel connections. Um, so we're, we're on site with about seven guys. These connections could either be welded or bolted. We'll usually want the connections to be bolted. There's seven guys on the crew that can bolt the connections. There's only one guy on the crew that can weld the connections. Um, so, and it's a lot faster. Uh, so we try to switch to bolted as soon as we can. But keep in mind your lower floors where there's heavier loads, potentially more beams and columns, so a little bit more lateral forces as well. Well, you'll see more welded connections in the lower floors. But as you move up the building, you'll start to see a lot more bolted connections. That's just for alignment. It doesn't affect the fire rating? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they're not a, a gravity connection, it, 
They're just mainly for alignment. Um, so you can see the, the, those are weld plates there, I believe. Uh, you'll normally see two per joint, normally. If you get some heavier weld connections, sometimes you'll see three or four, especially down in the parking garage or lower floors. This is that knife connection we were talking about. So this, it'll either stick out the end of the panel or out the face of the panel, depending on the location and detail. Um, so basically, you can kind of see the detail over here. We'll have the cast-in plates cast into, uh, this is the load-bearing wall. Cast-in plate, the knife sticks out, bears down on top of that. We have a bolt that's actually welded, or a nut welded to that plate. We put a bolt in there, and that's how we adjust it for level. And in, when, the, when the panels are smaller, we don't actually have to shim underneath that knife either. The bolt takes the force. And then for fire rating, they'll dry pack it full of grout. Um, if the panels are bigger, we'll put some one inch shims underneath that metal plate to transfer the load down into that weld plate. This six inch wall is a really economical wall. Um, it gets you a real cheap cladding on the building and that's where total precast really starts to make sense. If you can get that exterior finished with whatever finish you like, those six inch walls are very economical compared to any other cladding system. Yep. The panel or is that just an so the corner gets bolted through or it'll sit on top depending on the details. So it gets applied afterwards. So one thing with precast is keep in mind we're pouring it face down on a steel table. Yeah. So the steel table, we can't go into the steel table. So stuff that protrudes past the face of the panel is really an issue for us. So if you wanted a detail like that that protrudes past the face of the table, we'd either make it as a separate strip that sits on top of that six inch cladding wall or on top of the load bearing wall or we'd uh, bolt something onto the face of it afterwards. Now details like keystones around windows, we can play with all kinds of architectural reveals and stuff, we just can't get it to pop out. So we'll put banding in and stuff just to change colors or architectural features, but they can't pop out of the face of the panel. Um, so other than maximizing spans, probably the next biggest question or the issue that you're gonna deal with is how to support the balconies. Um, We've, got, we've kind of went from easiest or cheapest solution to more expensive solution. Um, this option here, we've got wing walls on each side. So this balcony is fully supported by this wing wall, this one, and then, well, it's two separate balconies, and then supported back here. So that it'll, be on the, it'll be outside of that six inch cladding wall that runs up past, so there's no thermal issues to deal with because you've got that continuous insulation that's running up past, and it's fully supported here and here. Very little cantilever, cantilever is about a foot, but there's enough of it sticking back that the cost is still economical. Um, anytime we can use two wing walls, we will. Obviously, some owners don't like to see their balconies closed right in, um, so then we'll flip into the, some other scenarios. But this is by far the most economical way to support your balconies. And then if you can get these wing walls to transfer down into, let's say there's a parking garage below, size your balcony so that the wing walls go down in between your parking spaces. Um, a lot of times that's actually pretty easy to do once you come to it, but if you can get that wing wall, adjust your balcony by a foot or six inches, whatever it is, so it falls in between your spaces, now you don't have to worry about trying to transfer that load in the parking garage as well. Sorry, how is the thermal bridge avoided now? Yeah, so this balcony is actually, so this is your exterior wall here. Yep. This balcony is actually sitting outside of that exterior wall. So it's just, these walls are connected back into it, but it's sitting proud of that six inch wall. Um, so this is something we did for an owner on a building. He was looking for a unique look. And after we did it, we said, hey, that worked really well. Um, so what it is is basically the same concept as a wing wall, but versus putting a wing wall right out to the face, we need to have a wall inside the suite. So let's say it's the load bearing wall inside the suite. And then we do a big cantilevered arm off the top of that wall to support the balcony. So now when you're on the balcony, you still have full visibility. It looks like that balcony is kind of hanging out there, but you still have that support underneath the balcony. So you just see these small beams that stick out of the side of the building, but yet it's nice and open underneath. How far out can you go? Uh, four, four and a half feet. So you'd probably, you'd put your, candle, it depends on the wall inside the building, right? So basically you gotta be able to balance the weight of that balcony back into that wall that's inside the building. If you're doing this, what you really need to do is try to line these up with either your suite walls or an interior wall that you're willing to change into precast, so let's say bedroom wall, so that you can just place it and it's not interfering in your suite layouts. 
Um, since we've done this, we've probably got four more projects right now that we're working with the same type of detail. Um, a lot of guys will do this on one side, they'll put a wing wall on one side, but then do this on the other side. As the, balcony step, or as the building steps in and out, you have the wing wall on this side of the step, but then you can have the cantilever beam to have that nice open view on this side. Uh, again, it's a bit, I would say 12 inches roughly, um, but it'll be a bit based on the size of the balcony and the amount of weight out there, but 12 to 16 inches, I would say. If you want to go further, you need to precast your phone. If, yeah, next option. <laughs> uh, so that's the cantilever beam option. So if you didn't want to do that, uh, we could actually make this wall load bearing then this back wall will be low bearing and then we can put a precast column in the corner or you could just make the back wall low bearing and then have two out exterior precast columns keep in mind with this option you're getting thermal bridging on both of these sides because we're low bearing here the floor will be low bearing on the other side so there's no room to bring the thermal up past as well as the same thing here but we do this all the time still kind of nice there they actually did two-story columns um, we'll see a picture later you can kind of see it they staggered the balconies and used wing walls but it actually looks like the balconies are sticking outside of the building and then the most expensive option is the cantilever balcony so you'll see these small four-foot balconies on this building as an example so what that is is just the floor slab we changed it to a solid plank and the solid plank cantilevers outside the building so now we can have that pre-finished balcony. So I should maybe explain that all our balconies are pre-finished. They're a wet cast product, not a holocore product. So we pour them just like we do the wall panels. So they'll have a four inch trowel edge around the outside. They'll be broomed, they'll be sloped to the exterior of the building. They'll have a drip edge on them. So they're finished, you don't have to touch them anymore. With, that, with this option though now, you, in order to get that nice pre-finished balcony, you've had to change the entire slab inside the building to solid as well. So now inside the building where you're normally paying for, let's say five bucks a square foot for holocore, now you're paying for 20 bucks a square foot balcony, so it's an extra cost. Plus you're having a full thermal transfer because it's going right outside your building. So same concept there, uh, they're just kind of leaving sideways versus just out the end. So this is a side, side cantilever, so there'll be a bigger solid, so we'll have to actually make that balcony eight feet wide, let's say, inside the building to get enough weight and room to tie the rebar back so that it can cantilever out the side. So we still do this a lot of times. If you're doing a port in place building, you have these same details all the time. The port in place slabs come outside the building. Um, this solid is a fair bit more expensive because you got to do a lot of cross or bring all the reinforcing from that back inside the building. Um, but if that's what your building calls for, we can do it. It's just not the most preferred. Uh, so precast parking garages. So most of our buildings will have at least one story. Um, some will have six stories of parking below the building. Same thing, like I explained with the wing walls, try to get your loads to transfer down into the parking garage. Uh, we can do a full complete parking garage below. Um, the only time we don't do that is if you can't get the loads to transfer. If you can't get the loads from your tower to transfer into your parking garage, we would probably recommend that you pour your parking garage and then switch to with a transfer slab to a precast building above. So we do that a fair bit too, but definitely the best option is if you can if we're helping you out enough, early enough in the design stage to try to work with the architect and the owner to get all those lines to transfer through. Doesn't always work, but. Where do you find, where do you find the right edges for a transfer slab? Um, so if you're pouring your, depends on your ground floor layout. If your ground floor layout's somewhat similar to the wall, the, I guess the right answer to that would be whenever your walls can continue. So let's say you have your tower walls from all between your suites wherever they really start to get messed up and not transfer down further. So let's say I level two, ground floor is completely different, none of those lo loads transfer down linear, that's where I'd put my transfer slab. Now let's say ground floor, you could actually transfer most of those walls down, I'd drop it down one level further. So the ones you're arguing, uh, what type of buildings are you going through a transfer slab? Um, it's not necessarily based on the height, it's based on the parking garage below. So we've done four stories with a transfer slab. We've done 32 stories with a transfer slab. It's, the key is to get those vertical loads to keep coming down. So if you can't get those vertical loads to keep coming down, that's when you run into the issue with transfer slabs. 
Um, yeah, well, obviously, yeah, the higher the building, the thicker the transfer slab's going to be. Yeah. Waste of money. Yeah. But in some sites, there's just no other way to do it, right? So we've built probably one in three still has a transfer slab, let's say. Um, a lot of the buildings that we first started with were port in place buildings that were all designed, ready to be built. They called us and said, hey, we'd like to try a precast option on this. And we'll sit down with them. Because the design's so far along, you, can, you don't have the chance to try to work some of this stuff out. But if we're in soon enough, we can work through some of that stuff with you. Um, so with the parking garage, the same concept, hollow core floors, precast walls, precast beams. Now on the level where, so like you'll have the drive alleys and stuff. So we'll need to put precast transfer beams over here. So on your top level of parking garage, leave extra headroom. We can, we can narrow up the beams on the lower levels because it's just a beam above a beam. But the level where you're going to have the walls sitting directly on the beam, leave some extra headroom so that we can design a deeper beam. Those beams will probably be three to four feet thick to support the walls above. On the floors, you used the steel and kept the bottom flat. On the, yeah. On the residential floor. Yeah, in, through the hallways. Yeah. Through the hallways. But we don't recommend steel in the parking garages uh, because now you've got to fire rate it. This is a finished product. When we're done these parking garages, they come in and paint them. This is the same parking garage painted down the road. So it's a finished parking garage. Right? Now, we, that being said, we do work a bit with uh, Delta Beam, Pico. Um, so if you have no head, if you have no headroom, it's a more expensive option. But if you have no headroom to work with, we actually have a thin slab beam that we can use. To, it's a steel beam with a, like a trapezoid shape on top that it has a fire rating, so you don't have to do any of that drywall work into it. They're at the show here too. But. Um, so a bit back into the thermal. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit. Layout's the big thing. Try to go for that sweet wall to sweet wall layout. Uh, balcony support. If you work with your balcony supports and use wing walls, you can limit the amount of thermal bridging. Uh, interior stud wall placement, making sure you have that steel stud an inch back. So on that exterior wall, make sure your steel studs leave a one inch gap between there and the precast wall so the spray foam goes in behind that steel stud wall. Um, size of window openings. So we can talk about the thermal bridging with the precast, but the main issue is going to be the size of your window still, right? There's, there's a ton of lost heat through windows, so just keep that in mind while you're designing your building. Um, I'm by far an expert on this subject, I would say. I'd highly recommend going to uh, CPCI's website and downloading the thermal guide, Meeting and Exceeding Building Code Thermal Performance. Uh, it was a study done by RDH Group. Uh, John Straub does some of the presentations. Definitely a very valuable resource. I think they have a course later on today if you're really interested in this. I'd highly recommend trying to sit in on that course. And CPCI is here at the show and they have a, a bit more information on it as well. Any other questions on the design side of it a little bit? We got some sample projects. We'll go through some of the details and what we did. But, uh, so this is a four story on Bloor Street in Mississauga. So you can see they used like a, just a concrete reveal pattern here, switched it to like a concrete block pattern here, painted it red. We left the joints and we coat the bricks. We leave the joints gray, giving it that brick look. Um, they had some fancy cornices around the top. Um, owners are very happy with this building. We built it with First Gulf, and they have a second building right now that we're they're in sales on it right now. So, yep. Yeah. So that's the cornice. So that that's a separate. It's actually a whole separate piece. So the wall panel here will stop at the underside of that cornice, and then it's a separate, almost like a beam mold that we use, and it's just separate strips that we put place along the top. Now, let's say you wanted a cornice here. So you'll notice here they kind of did like a band. They didn't protrude anything. But um, we've done some projects where they actually want a cornice here. Then we'll just do a thin cornice that's like six inches thick. And we do through bolt connections and then just bolt it onto the face of the panel. So you can do it. It's just a different detail. And it's a separate piece. Separate piece usually adds cost, right? So. Yeah, so these are cantilevered two feet, but they still have enough bearing inside the building so that they can do a bit of cantilever. So you don't have to be fully supported by your wing walls, but you need to have 60% of your balcony supported by the wing walls. Yeah. 
It's a two-thirds, one-third ratio. Um, details like this, the detailing around the windows, there's no cost to stuff like that. So we, you'll see some coming up with keystones, arcs. I think this one's actually got the arcs. Yeah, you can see the arcs over there. That's easy for us to do. It's just as simple as putting some reveals down on the tables. So that's a very inexpensive way to dress up the building. Um, this is a Hampton Inn we did in Sarnia. Um, so we worked with this owner previously doing a lot of hotels up north. Um, we started doing precast stair shafts and precast elevator shafts, and he was doing steel stud walls, uh, in, uh, suite walls. And then we did the, because he used to pour in place his stair shafts and his elevator shafts. He's like, we need to do this faster. It's up north. I can't find the trades. So we did the precast stair shafts and elevator shafts for him with the hollow core floors. We actually did it the same time the steel stud guy was swinging. We had one crane on one side, one crane on the other. We got done the project, he said, still not fast enough for me. I need a faster system. It's too many headaches. So he had this project in Sarnia. He said, I'd like to see a total precast hotel. So we worked together with Hampton Inn and the owner, came up with this precast designed hotel. Job went really well. Uh, since then, we've built two more hotels in Niagara Falls and one more in Brantford. I don't know if anybody's from that area, but it's the one right on Garden Ave. It's a six-story hotel, roughly 10,000, 12,000 square feet of floor. It was built in 28 working days, complete structure. So that's all your walls, your porte de out the front, all your cornices, your caps, basically ready for interior finishes. Have you ever done a project with the windows in the panel? Haven't. Um, we're playing with that theory. Haven't found the right job to do it with yet. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a great opportunity. Because if we can put the windows in in the factory, then the panels show up you have nothing to do the exterior of the panel, right? All you do is cock your joints and you have a finished exterior panel. Why does everybody say they're still playing with the idea? Uh, nobody's just got to take the jump. <laughs> our, our fear is damage to windows. That's what's holding us back. We're worried about breaking the windows during transportation, lifting. Um, the guys throw the chains over the truck, they smash the chain through the window. Um, you can glaze the windows on site pretty easy. Pardon me? Oh, like put the glass in. Yeah. That's a valid point. Yeah. Question? On a project like that, what, what, what's your engineering time and your fabrication time? So that's a good question. So the time in the precast isn't the time on site. It's, pre, it's the time in advance. So let's say a project like this. I'm going to say a 10-story building because it's kind of in the middle. So let's say a 10-story building, 10,000 square feet of floor. Um, let's assume you have somewhat finalized architectural, not finalized ready for construction, but at least permit set of architectural drawings. And you've kind of made your final architectural changes. Um, we'd need about 10 to 12 weeks to do erection drawings. So that's our precast shop drawings. They, for the most part, are a big part of your structural drawings as well, because all the main reinforcing is in those walls. Um, so 10 to 12 weeks to put all that together, two weeks for approvals. Um, but during that 10 to 12 weeks, we're going to need elevator coordination, because we'll cast in all the rails for the elevator guys direct into the wall panels. We're going to need M&E coordination. Um, this one doesn't have it because it's PTAX on the outside, built into the windows. But normally, we'll actually cast the vent boxes right into the uh, precast wall panels. And they, all they have to do is tie their duct up to it, and we snap a grill into the face of it, and it's done. Um, so we need time to coordinate all those locations during that 10 to 12 weeks. So that's where Sean was saying, you've got to bring the M&E guys on early, as well as the elevator guys, so that we can do that coordination between us. Very few M&E um, engineers are willing to have that coordination. It's usually the trades that have to do that coordination. Um, so, during, so it's 10 to 12 weeks for the erection drawings, two weeks for approval, one week for us to do any revisions once it comes back, and then we're into piece tickets. So once we give you that full set of drawing, we have to break it down into individual pieces for every piece. That process, we need about three weeks, and then we're into production. We'd like to produce for about three weeks prior to starting on site. And then the production will just keep up with the on site crews. So, curing time is. Uh, so, our concrete next day is 35, 4,000 psi. Um, so with this coating, this current coating here, you'll get a 10-year warranty. Um, knock off, if you do the staining process, they'll offer a 25. On our projects, we only offer a 10 still. Um, I just don't know if 25 is a realistic warranty. Um, so we'll just offer a 10-year warranty on the knock off stain as well. Uh, but the nice thing that guys like with the painted finish versus an integral color is the colors of today is different than the colors of tomorrow. So within 15 years, to recoat that building and completely change the look of the building is very inexpensive. Right? You're 
two bucks a square foot on the face of the building. So for 80 grand, let's say roughly, you have a complete revamped exterior to help with rentals, et cetera. So when we're normally brought in is you need to have some just basic architectural plans, some maybe just a little bit more than scratching on a napkin, um, but just some basic plans with your architect. We'll sit down, we'll run through, we need to know your floor to floor elevations, we need to know where you want that form liner finish on the exterior, and then we'll give you a budget price, and then we join that design team. Um, so depending on the project and how fast paced it is, um, we're pretty much in the same time you're hiring your engineer of record, just to work along beside the team. It's more of a design build approach. Um, so if you wanted to build a 10 story building, we'd be in eight months ahead of time. Okay, That's yep. what you're looking at. You say at least when you, when you want to start the construction, so yep. we're going to start the construction coming summer. And yep. we have to work with you, I can say, at least eight months ahead of time, right? Yeah, rough. Now, we've done it a lot faster than that, but a safe yeah, number so would be the eight yeah, months, right? Yeah. So. Um, we don't, so we obviously, we prefer to drive back and forth every day. So we'll drive back and forth within an hour and a half. Um, but we've worked in Thunder Bay, Barrie, North Bay, Ottawa, we'll work all over. Um, cost, really the transportation cost and the full scope of the project isn't that big. It doesn't play a major, you might be a buck a square foot premium, but it, it doesn't add up. Well, that far it would, but <laughs> but within let's say let's say a four-hour radius, five-hour radius, it doesn't add that much cost to it. What is uh, what is your production capability? Like, uh, say for instance, if you're building Yeah, so we're probably running an average of five to six jobs at a time. Um, we recently built a new precast facility, so we have the existing facility which we used to run four buildings, three to four buildings at a time out through. Then we have this new building that we started in 2015. It was finished in 2016, so it's been operation for about a year and a half. It's still got a ton of capacity that we haven't tapped into yet. Um, so yeah, we could run six, seven buildings at a time. Now, that being said, because we have those eight month lead times, sometimes our lead times are a lot different than they used to be, kind of thing. Right? Uh, this is a Jackson Street apartment. You can see the different keystone detail. This is in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, so it just reveals in the columns down at the bottom, then they went to like a stone liner, and then the brick liner up above. You can see the cast-in mechanical vent boxes, cast-in PTAC openings. Um, this is a building with TriCar in Woodstock. Um, so just to, this is a rental building, just that simple, just change the colors to get the look, versus putting in the fancy architectural mold liner finishes. And this building actually looks really nice. Um, we're, we're close to the Woodstock. I drive by this job all the time. It's a, it's a nice looking building. That looks nice. So the sweet spot that we find, and this is probably just doesn't matter our system or any system, is a floor pin of 20,000 square feet, 10 floors tall. If you can find a piece of land that has that, that's your best bang for your buck. That's your best cost per square foot. Sorry, you say that again? So 10 stories tall and about 15 to 20,000 square feet of floor. With a sheer, with a sweet to sweet wall layout. That's your optimum size that we've found. And also talking to Tricar, we've done probably I don't know how many projects, twelve with Tricar. Um, that's their best building too, all the way around. But, um, this is Riverbank Lofts in Cambridge. We did this with Hip Developments and Mellow Blamey Construction. Um, you'll notice here, this is the two-story balcony, so they just staggered their balcony. So they have consistent wing walls that run up the face of the building, but you don't really notice them because you have these nice glass railings and the staggered balcony. So it gives that open look, but yet they've had the, they had the, cheap, the cheapest balcony option, easily supported. So it's just playing with those details to make the building look nice. Um, this, this side actually looks over a lake. It's a really nice project. This is a 255 Sunview in Waterloo. Um, so originally, they came to us with this building and said, sorry, we can't, we can't do this building for you. Your timelines are too tight. Um, he called us back and said, I've got the drawings done. This is January. Um, I really like, I need you guys to do this building. We said, well, here's our schedule. We can 
probably get it done by June 1st. Um, he said, okay, do it, but keep in mind this is a student resident, so they had to open September 1st. So we started this, we started erecting precast, I believe, June, January 15th, February 1st, I can't remember the exact time. We finished a month early from what we said, so we were done 1st of May. They occupied this project in September. Yeah, so this is those cantilevered arms. Here's another example of, whoop, um, is those cantilevered arms right there. So are those clips, steel clips? Are they clips? Yeah, so that's, I explained he had the drawings all done. We basically just had to push the button and enter it into production. Um, we didn't have time to change these details. If we had that design time up front, definitely wouldn't have allowed those details to go through. You can avoid it, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 there's no, there's no, absolutely no reason to have those connections there. Yeah. Yeah, and how do you ever treat them in the future, right? They're just going to start rusting eventually again. This is for the same owner as that previous building. So it's a, basically a one-story underground parking across the entire site, and then two main podium towers with towers, or two main podiums with five towers on top of those podiums. Um, we did a, it's about 500,000 square feet of holocore, so surface area. We started in July of the first year, we're done probably April 1st of the next year, I think. Uh, we had three crews at a time working on this project, though. So. Um, this is another building in Waterloo. It's a, a lot smaller square foot. The, the floor print on this building was only 3,500 square feet, I think. Uh, but what that does is drive costs. You're split, spreading all your engineering costs, all your other costs over 3,500 square feet per floor on your tower. Um, so this building's a lot more expensive. So in, so let, we're from uh, Woodstock, Brantford area. Within, let's say, a two hour radius, assuming that building that's 10 stories tall, about 15,000 square feet of floor, we'd be ranging in the area of the low 30s to mid 30s per square foot on the horizontal square foot from a cost standpoint. So, you, and that's a finished exterior. So keep in mind, you no longer need a brick layer. You no longer need um, any steel, Stru any structural cast in place concrete. The only thing you need to do is put in your footings or your foundations and then the precast above that. This is another building where they use, this is the, sorry? Yeah, in this uh, document, I have read about the pre-stressed yep. print, but it's not in it. has not been covered in your presentation. Maybe I did not pay attention. Yeah, so the six inch cladding walls are the walls that have the pre-stress in them. So that's why we need that 300 above the window and the 300 below the window or the 250 below the windows so that we can run pre-stressing strands through those panels to make them act like beams and transfer the loads out to the, the load-bearing suite walls. Post-tension? Pre-stress, not post-tension. This is the first total precast building we did in Barrie. Um, first one ever for us, actually. Uh, so it's actually, a, it was all designed, poured in place. It had a four-story parking garage and then a building shaped like a triangle on top because it's right on the waterfront in Barrie. And they wanted every balcony to be able to see the lake. Uh, so what we did is we actually, obviously none of the loads transferred that well into the parking garage. So we did a four-story parking garage. These are all fake windows. So that's that three-inch recess in the panels. They just put in fake glazing to make it look nice from the street because it's right downtown Barrie. And then once we got to the top, we put on our cornices. We put in a precast solid slab. Um, and then on that precast solid slab, they actually formed a transfer slab two feet thick. So we finished the solid slab. They came in, did the transfer slab, and then we built the building above afterwards. Um, so in behind this, there's a wall that the, the, or the load bearing wall steps in and out. It's a bit of a fun design. Um, and then we actually, I'm trying to remember, we ran a beam. It's a bit of a mess. It's hard to explain really without a drawing. Um, but these are all solid planks still. And that's cantilevered. You can't really see them in this picture, but there's those cantilevered beams we talked about on this side. And then they're bearing back on this wing wall here on the other side. Um, so we're currently working with Halfin um, to come through with some options. Right now it's the cost, so nobody's forced to do it. We're more than willing to do it, it's just the cost of some of these connections right now. 
in the future, I see a ton of this stuff coming out. Today, it just doesn't quite make sense yet. Uh, we're at a Brantford area. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're in talks with them right now, but they do still do all their design work in Germany, and then they produce the connections, I believe, in Brantford. Right. Um, no idea what my time's like. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is another building for Tricar in Guelph. This is a student residence in Waterloo. Here they just use the same plain finish, just played with colors and shapes to get the architectural look. This is uh, King and Lyle, downtown London, Ontario. Um, Three-story parking garage below this building as well. Nice big wide open spans. I think we were 40 foot spans on there. This is a Phillips Street project in Waterloo. Um, very nice looking buildings. Uh, we did the first one. Um, the owner is very happy. We have s since built the second one completed and we're in the process of producing panels for the third one. The site has four buildings. Um, this building here, it's about 9,000, 10,000 square feet of floor. We did multiple floors in four days per floor. Um, so, very fast. Sorry, can you see it again? So the, the, the floor print is 10,000 square feet. So, include, so the floor and the walls, we stood all that ready for the next floor. So 10,000 square feet of floor plus the walls on top. We did that in four working days on site, ready for the next level. But the key, the key here is your, your finishing trays and your contractor needs to be set up and ready to handle that kind of speed. Um, we've done buildings where we hit the 30th level and they're still trying to figure out how to do M&E coordination on ground two, on level two, seriously. Um, it, it's a big, it's a, it's a total different world for them to move that fast because a lot of people say they'll move that fast, but they don't actually move that fast. We try to over, under promise and over deliver. So if we tell you six days, we try to get it done. We're actually counting on getting it done in five. But it's a lot easier to come to the client afterwards and say, uh, yeah, we're three weeks early versus, sorry, we're three weeks late. So. Have you ever done a project where you're using the cores and the slabs for ventilation or anything like that? Yeah. Um, it? Don't like it. Don't but. Like it? So we'll do it. The only jobs we've done it on are uh, government jobs. Uh, just the cost, yeah. the average owner is not going to pay for that. No. But. And that's it for the presentation. Does anybody else have any other questions that they'd like to have answered? Thanks a lot for listening. Appreciate everybody for coming out. Uh, if you'd like to learn more and maybe see some of the finishes we do, we're at booth 45 in the World of Concrete Pavilion. Um, I'll be there or some of the other guys will be there, Sean. Um, appreciate for coming out and spending the time with us.